Welcome, friends, to Woodbury Elementary School. I'm Stephen Murphy, member of Woodbury Community Library Board of Trustees. On behalf of the trustees, I'm pleased to introduce our event tonight, a presentation by Middlesex, Vermont resident and author Susan Clark, titled, Rediscovering the Secrets of Town Meeting and Community. This presentation is one of several initiatives by the library in co cooperation with volunteers, town officials, and Woodbury Elementary School to provide information and activities promoting town meeting and citizen engagement in town government. We wish to thank for organizing and promoting this event Library Director Myrna Miranda O'Neill and Orca. Thank you. The setting for our talk tonight, Woodbury Elementary School, is fitting. Built in 1914, this school is a sturdy, beautiful, and special place where we educate our children, where we gather for community events such as talent shows and fundraisers, and where we assemble for our town meetings. Tonight, we will learn about and discuss town meeting, and we will exercise our rights freedom to assemble, freedom to speak, and freedom to exchange information and ideas which are so fundamental to our democracy. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis in 1932 described the states of our nation as laboratories of democracy. If that is so, then Woodbury is Vermont's laboratory workbench. Here, on gray granite slabs drawn from our quarry on the hill, and on the pillars of folding tables and chairs, folded neatly in the corners of our public buildings, we tinker and toil, trying always to perfect this glorious small town government of, by, and for ourselves. And we succeed. Here in Woodbury, we are generous enough to give respect to our neighbor despite disagreement. We are strong enough to withstand differences without breaking into division and wise enough to understand that civility in our town hall and public places leads to peace in our homes and private spaces. So, onward to our discussion about our featured speaker. Susan lives with her family in Middlesex, Vermont, where she serves as town moderator and Chair of Town Meeting Solutions Committee. Susan is a writer, teacher, award-winning radio commentator, and former talk show co-host. She co-authored the books, All Those in Favor, Rediscovering the Secrets of Town Meeting and Community with Frank Bryan, and the book Slow Democracy, Rediscovering Community bringing decision-making back home with co-author Woden Ticha. And recently, she collaborated on the comic book Freedom and Unity, a graphic guide to civics and democracy in Vermont. In recognition of her work, Susan received the 2010 Vermont Secretary of State Enduring Democracy Award. So, Please join us in welcoming Susan to Woodbury. Together, we'll learn about our democratic traditions, current practices, and potential steps to keeping our town governments and communities strong. I'm pleased to introduce Susan Buck.
Um, thanks to the Woodbury Community Library for inviting me and the Woodbury Town Meeting Committee for putting many hours already of time and effort into studying how to improve Woodbury's democracy. Can everybody hear me okay? You know, we've got a lot of refrigeration going on here, so. Um, and I especially want to thank you uh, for being here and, and for caring about your community. So the organizers have asked me to speak a little about Vermont's Town Meeting, its tradition, its history, uh, what the process does, and... Um, those who participate and for our communities, its role in the state today, which is a lot to pack into 35 or 40 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna try, but we will definitely leave time for questions and uh, discussion at the end. Um, so let's see, without further ado, here we go. Uh, so it's hard to know where to begin to list all the factors uh, that have informed uh, Vermont's current system of governance. Um, you could actually go back to the Ice Age. You literally could because glaciers shaped our landscape into the hills and valleys that have had such an impact on our compact village and town settlement pattern. Um, that Native American populations who have lived in and moved across uh, our region for thousands of years. Um, and simply the climate, right? I mean, I don't know, I just drove here in the snow. Uh, especially the short growing season, the brutal winters, um, they have encouraged us to meet our needs collectively. But if you fast forward to the colonial era, it is actually hard to imagine Vermont without town meetings. And there is a reason for that. We were in fact holding town meetings here in Vermont for a decade and a half before Vermont was even officially a state. So, uh, Oh, wrong guy, just a second, here we go. Oh, no, there's a, okay, I'll show this one. Yeah, this is, I love this. Um, so Bennington held its first town meeting in 1762. If you think about life back in 1762, town meeting was the most important political power operating in Vermont because New York and New Hampshire were still arguing over who was in charge, right? So. Uh, neither had any real control over our daily life. Settlement, uh, the settlers had really no government to rely on except the one that they formed at town meetings. So the first order of business in Bennington in 1762 was to elect town officers and a town moderator. They were all men, of course. Um, women didn't get the right to vote uh, in municipal elections until 1917. Um, once they got it though, their participation in town meetings uh, is impressive. We'll get to that in a few minutes. So throughout, New England, town meetings historically had jurisdiction over a lot of things that have since been handed to uh, the state and federal governments. The first town meeting in Bennington uh, allocated $40 and five acres to allow anyone willing to uh, set up a grist mill by August um, got, to, got, to, got to claim that $40 and five acres. So economic development happening right there at our town meeting. Other town meetings voted to um, meet other community needs from establishing schools, uh, requiring every man to pitch in a day's labor to clear land for a town cemetery. This is where communities made commitments to care for their poor or destitute neighbors, right? Social services. Um, and defense, uh, that's where this comes in, don't forget. Uh, it was at a town meeting in Boston that Samuel Adams gave the signal to begin the Boston Tea Party. This is what comes of their wretched town meetings. The proceedings of a tumultuous and riotous rabble, said the English governor at the time. So a lot has changed. We're not raising a lot of militia at our town meetings, but some crucial things have stayed the same. And especially the main thing that makes town meeting really stand out as a governance structure. This hasn't changed. You've all heard this before, but it bears repeating. The New England town meeting is really unusual because it's direct, deliberative democracy. So what does that mean? Direct, it means town meeting, you, are the legislative arm of town government on issues of finance and governance. This is a policy-making institution. So town meeting is very different from the town hall meetings that you hear about, right, where politicians give speeches. We see these on TV in other states. Uh, Town meeting is not one of those town hall meetings. And it's very different from a public hearing where voters come to voice their opinions or you know, advise their elected officials. So town meeting is a deliberative body. Um, at a traditional town meeting on issues of finance and governance, every registered voter is a legislator. We're making binding decisions about spending, 
making amendments, otherwise taking direct action um, at, in our government. So government's not a they. Like, why don't they do this? Government is a we. We are the government at town meeting. Now, of course, we only have power over very local issues, our, our local budget, our roads, a certain amount of discretionary uh, funding, nonprofits. So our jurisdiction is limited, but the power is real, and the decisions are binding. Um, and um, when I said, I said direct deliberative democracy, so not only do we have the power, the direct power, you walk in and you are empowered, we're not elected. Um, but the process, when I say deliberation, it allows us to chew on issues. Uh, together as part of the decision making. Um, we're a town parliament. Anybody take French? Parler means to talk, right? We come together, weigh the pros and cons, we see and hear each other and potentially change each other's minds, potentially change our own mind. So in the US, town meetings only occur in New England. Um, when America moved west, town meetings did not uh, go with them, and uh, partly, again, because of the landscape. Um, uh, the landscape here lends itself to such community-based government. Um, and I'm told there is something, uh, something like a town meeting in the Israeli kibbutz system, um, and I can tell you that Switzerland has a robust town meeting system. Um, I uh, had a lot of fun visiting Switzerland to tour their town meetings um, a few years ago, and sometime I'll come back and give a great slideshow on that, but um, nowhere else that I'm aware of uh, besides New England, um, uses this town meeting system. So town meeting is special. Um, and um, one of the things, one of the ways we know the most about town meeting today is um, the recognized expert on town meetings, Frank Ryan, um, who uh, is a retired UVM political science professor, my co-author on all those in favor. Um, now, Professor Bryan spent 30 years uh, sending students, sending students like me, as a matter of fact, um, and uh, thousands of others to literally attend thousands of town meetings across the state during, that, during those 30 years of data collection. Um, so students would come to a town meeting, count attendance four times during that meeting. How many men? How many women? Who spoke? How many times? How long did they speak? What was the weather? Was there a meal? Was there childcare? Uh, amazingly rich data that he collected uh, in this book, uh, Real Democracy. And he had some important findings, many of which surprised the world of political science. Can I just say, just like at any good town meeting, you guys should totally access the cookies, okay? Like, <laughs> this is like, we, uh -huh. What's a little spoiled food, right? Wonderful. Thank you. Now everybody remembers. <laughs> 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 there was a year when uh, Dan Brush called me and said, Did we, that, did we plug that refrigerator back in and get to come down to my other key? I think so. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just, oh, this is so much better. Oh my gosh, thank you. Okay. Um, so, Frank Ryan's data, um, he found, he had some important findings and interestingly, um, because town meeting is uh, unique, um, he, um, many of them correlated with political science uh, findings across the nation and some of them did not. Some of them, he found there were some things that were quite interesting about town meeting that political science was fascinated by. So I'll just run through some of the basics. Um, uh, the bit, now here's just, Basics, attendance, no real surprises here. You probably know that town meetings are struggling. In 2005, the 30-year average attendance was 20.5%, um, but attendance has been declining. And Brian's most recent average was down to 11%. Um, significantly higher in smaller towns than bigger ones, um, which we will discuss in a minute. 
So attendance is crucial, and it's important that we talk about ways to improve it. And I do have some suggestions about that that have been proven, so we'll talk about that. But that said, perspective is important. We might think, oh my gosh, 11% of the voters deciding for 100% of the town, this is terrible. But comparing town meeting attendance to 100% of the checklist just isn't realistic because you have to remember these are very local issues. Now across the country, turnout for ballot box voting on local issues is rarely higher than 25%. And often it can even struggle to get into the single digits. Just last spring, May of 2022, Barrytown had its annual vote all by ballot, passed a $4.4 million general fund budget, 13.6% of the registered voters taking part. That's not uncommon. So we have to remember that, the, that what we're comparing things with isn't you know, some kind of 100% ideal. What's realistic? So back to town meeting, why is attendance going down? Uh, Brian identified three key factors, and the first one I mentioned already, the size of the town. Um, small towns get much bigger uh, uh, per capita attendance than larger towns. This was the case in Frank Bryan's 30-year analysis, and it still holds up. In 2019, uh, towns of under 2,500 got more than twice the per capita attendance of larger towns. So those averages that I mentioned were all towns mixed together, which brings the average down. It doesn't mean large towns can't have town meetings. This is just an average. Many large towns do have successful town meetings. But it does tell us that structuring decision making on that human scale where people can feel their impact most authentically does improve participation. And that's a key finding from uh, Frank Brown's research. Another one, issues matter. Big surprise, right? Any, anyone who's ever been to a town meeting knows this. After town size, the single strongest predictor of attendance is whether there's hot issues on the morning, right? So the thing that's surprising to me is that this finding surprised political science. They had long believed that Americans hate controversy, but his research proved that controversy actually draws participation to town meeting. So what's the difference between town meeting and all of those other places in America where people are repelled by controversy? The difference is power. Voters don't want to go to a town hall meeting where they all yell at each other but have no power. But if they know that they can make a difference, if they know that their vote matters, if they know that they are coming as part of a collective that is going to make a binding decision, they come. What are you doing? How's that thing coming up? <laughs> so, some other refrigerator. <laughs> so the point is town meeting might be sleepy for a few years. Um, you might see, uh, must be the other fridge. <laughs> um, town meeting might be sleep, uh, have sleepy attendance for a few years and then suddenly you're looking at the, thank you, um, looking at the attendance and you see a spike. Um, and it, you know, so attendance might go like from 15% up to 65 suddenly and you investigate, inevitably what you find is that something has come up. That town is citing windmills or whatever it is and citizens use this powerful tool of town meeting to come and make their voice heard. So it's a reminder that town meeting as a structure waits for us. If we invest in it, then it's there when we need it. And the third key factor uh, that Frank Bryan found was Australian ballot, um, especially when it's uh, used to decide the budget. So in recent years, more towns have switched from the traditional floor meeting to Australian ballot. Um, and what they have is a so-called informational meeting a few days before. Um, and I don't know if you've ever lived in a town or been to a town that, that, that uses this um, system, but the informational meeting, it looks like a town meeting. It, uh, it, you know, you've got the select board up in the front and the people in the chairs. And, um, but by statute, it is actually a public hearing. Um, so voters can speak and listen, but no decisions are made here. The, the town meeting, where the actual power is, is the ballot. The thing is that voters know the difference. If you could like invent a heat sensor that could feel where the power was and you, and you put the heat sensor over an informational meeting and you put it over a town meeting, the lights would light up completely differently. At a town meeting, the power is, is in the body. Um, so ballot box voting, it's quicker, it's easier than going to a meeting. Australian ballot does result, uh, generally speaking, in uh, more voting. Um, and we saw this during COVID when, when towns switched uh, uh, temporarily. 
um, to Australian ballot. Um, but it usually also results in a much less uh, robust turnout for the informational meeting. Um, and at that informational meeting, the discussion is, is um, often quite limited. But more important than that might be the invisible effect that these types of informational hearings have over time. They change the nature of local democracy. So rather than that direct deliberative democracy that we were talking about, they're, they're much closer to what political scientists call conventional participation. Um, so uh, to be clear, the majority of America's formal participation across the US, it's defined as conventional participation. This means most of the meetings are public hearings held by school boards, city councils, state and federal agencies, where everybody gets two minutes at the microphone. Um, at a public hearing, participants they have no power to decide, um, no power to amend. And social scientists have been uh, collecting information on conventional participation since they were you know, enshrined in law in the 1950s. I mean, public hearings have been around for a while. Um, and um, so they interview people you know, before the hearings and afterwards. They, they, they watch policy as it evolves, uh, policy that's made through public hearings. And according to their research, many conventional participation tools like public hearings are, they're, they're, they're worse than just ineffective. Here are some quotes um, from this uh, recent public participation. This is a, a public administration textbook. I'm just gonna quote here. Conventional participation can be harmful to citizens. So it, it tends to increase our feelings of powerlessness. It tends to decrease our political interest, de decrease our trust in government, uh, decrease our sense of public spiritedness. Um, and it can actually damage perceptions of governmental leg legitimacy and credibility. It can actually even increase polarization uh, as people shift toward more extreme positions. It's, it's not what we want, but it gets worse because it is also, um, what about the leaders who are running these meetings? Um, it, uh, it's frustrating, it's discouraging, it's sometimes even dangerous to deal with these hostile, uninformed citizens at public hearings. Um, and the outcomes um, also uh, take, a, take a hit. Um, because uh, the relationship tends to deteriorate between the people and their institutions. All of a sudden we have this sense that government is a they, and they are not doing what we want. The legitimacy and financial stability of governments can actually decline. So it kind of comes down to what kind of communities we want when we're, when we're considering, yeah, actual picture, right? We're, when we're considering public engagement, we need to realize that the, the structure of the meetings, the structure of how we bring people together and where that power resides, it can have lasting consequences on, on how we perceive our role in democracy. So let's talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit about inclusion um, because inclusion is one of the things um, one of the reasons that, um, rightly so, people say, well, gosh, maybe we should be using a ballot. We will we'll get more inclusion, more people. Um, and I get it. I'm in favor of inclusion, too. Um, so, as I'm sure you're aware, ballot box voting in the United States is notoriously skewed. We've been hearing a lot about this. Um, to our great shame, as Americans, factors like race, income, educational level, help predict Americans' likelihood to vote and access to voting. So what about town meeting? What's its record for inclusion? Well, we have to start with the fact that Vermont is among the whitest states in the United States. So it goes without saying that our town meetings are overwhelmingly white. But Vermont is quite socioeconomically diverse. And town meeting observations can shine some light on groups that are typically underrepresented in our democracy. And it's interesting. Professor Bryan assumed that town meetings would behave like the rest of our political structures um, and that they might exclude uh, certain classes of people. But try as he might, with the 30 years of data, he could find no link between any of a town's socioeconomic factors, so it's indicators like people's occupation level or levels of education, and that town's attendance at town meeting or their verbal participation at town meeting, because like I said, he has people actually counting how many people talked and for how long. Likewise, he found no link between whether a town is socioeconomically diverse and whether people uh, attend town meeting. And in fact, socioeconomic diversity increases the amount 
the amount that people actually speak at a town meeting, which is political science considered to be a really good thing. So this data suggests that town meetings are actually more welcoming than America's ballot system, which is something, it's something that we can be proud of, but it's something we can learn from. There are elements of that face-to-face -face democracy that actually often invite marginalized populations. What's the story with that? Actually, I'll show you another thing first. Yeah. Um, town meeting, it offers different ways of knowing. Uh, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to, this is, a, this is a quality, it's not a quantity, it's a quality of town meetings. It incorporates a variety of backgrounds and wisdom. So yes, there are people giving speeches, there are people quoting data, sounding educated. There are also people who are just telling their stories. They're telling their stories about, well, this is, you know, this is what happened when my car got stuck on that road. This is what happened when I used home health and hospice. It's a place where we humanize, and we've all seen it. Town meeting is a place where a story from a neighbor can shed a whole new light and often even carry the day. So we have to ask ourselves, not just about the quantity of democracy, but the quality. So I do want to move on to women. Um, it's another measure of inclusivity. Now you have to keep in mind that town meeting is a legislature. So we're creating and setting the tax rate. We are amending and passing budgets. In Washington, D.C., in Montpelier, and in Vermont's city councils and select boards, our policies are almost always crafted disproportionately by men. In 2021, we celebrated the highest percentage of women in Congress in U.S. history, woo 25%. <laughs> but in Vermont's town meetings, women regularly make up nearly 50% of the attendees and are often in the majority. So a majority of legislators are female. That's an extraordinary statement to be able to make in the United States, and we can make it about Vermont's town meetings. So it's a crucial moment, I think, in American democracy. We kind of have to ask ourselves not only what town meeting can teach us, but maybe what lessons can town meeting offer the rest of the country? I think one of the most heartbreaking changes that we're witnessing today is that many Americans are showing signs of having forgotten the basics of democracy, how to speak civilly, how to listen respectfully to people that we disagree with, how to identify things we do have in common, how to move forward together, Americans are really out of practice. It's this regular, empowered community deliberation that is the oxygen of a healthy democracy. Hearing our neighbors' values, publicly deliberating about our own, it hones our most critical democratic skills. Of all the things democracy needs right now, I have to think one of the most important ones is remembering how to listen to each other, seeing each other, understanding that we are in this together. We may not like each other, but we need to respect each other. Vermont's town meeting tradition has been going on since 1762, but it can also help us explore our unique political situation today. So um, Stephen mentioned that in addition to all those in favor, I co-authored a book about all different kinds of local decision-making processes across the US, and we called our book Slow Democracy. Um, uh, when we advocate for slow, we are taking inspiration from the slow food movement. Um, it's a reminder of the need for place-based, human-scale democracy. Not that we think everything should move more slowly. <laughs> more time between decisions, longer meetings. Um, so as my co-author and I collected success stories from across the U.S., we saw that local decision-making that's, that's inclusive and deliberative and empowered help us actually become less polarized and more productive. And so because of this, slow democracy is ironically often the fastest meth method. So, so why is this? Why does slow help? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Whether we are talking about local or national issues, human beings have a problem. And the problem is that sometimes it is hard to listen to people that we don't agree with. Does anybody else have this problem? <laughs> so brain science shows us that we all suffer from this problem. Um, and there is some remarkable science. Let's see if I can, oh, here's the local, the inclusive, deliberative, empowered. Um, 
my jargon slide. Um, so there was a well-known study in 2006, uh, but it was, had, had been replicated many times since then. So researchers wired up some voters to explore what exactly happens inside the brain when we receive new information, especially if we perceive that that information doesn't fit our worldview. So they took a group of self-described Republicans and Democrats, and they subjected them to unflattering information about their own party's candidates. Now, according to their MRIs, when subjects were confronted with information that contradicted their biases, their brains actually under-processed the information. The prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for conscious reasoning, hardly even fired. Are these some um, movement activated? Yeah. <laughs> I told you we needed cookies. <laughs> Motion activated, all right. So, so their brains were actually, they were taking this information and, the, and the, part, the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for conscious reasoning, it didn't even light up. And instead, it was the emotional circuits of the brain that lit up when they were hearing things Republicans were hearing bad things about Republicans, or Democrats were hearing bad things about Democrats. Basically, participants' brains used emotion to ignore the information that they didn't want to hear, but that they couldn't discount intellectually. So remember, this is a physiological reaction, and it happens to all of us. Um, Jonathan Haidt is a, this is a great book, by the way, The Righteous Mind. Um, he explains, uh, he's a social scientist, and explains that, the, that this idea of us, them, that us, them mentality, it actually is innate. Um, identifying who is on my team and, and who isn't, it gave us a survival advantage, right? Back when we were banding together, you know, in tribes for protection. Thank you very much, evolution. Um, so Haidt explains that in the case of many of our polarizing values, so liberal conservative, rural urban, um, we aren't just talking about opinions. We're talking about worldviews. They're, they're part of our identities. And we are physiologically wired to defend them. So if we want to live in a world where we can take in new information, we need to frame the conversation in a way that doesn't challenge a person's identity. And that takes patience and a certain amount of big-heartedness. Catherine Schultz, um, who has a wonderful TED talk on this, by the way, she is the author of the book Being Wrong. She has comically pointed out that when we encounter someone we disagree with, we often react with a, with a three-point scale. So the first thing, if you disagree with me, I think, oh, you just need more information. But what if I generously share my facts? Then <laughs> you still disagree. Mm, I might move on to number two. Okay, <laughs> the idiot assumption, because you have all the information, you're too moronic to see things my way. Now, if that turns out not to be true, if the person we disagree with has all the information and they turn out to be pretty smart, we might move on to number three. <laughs> you know perfectly, the truth perfectly well, you're distorting it for your own malevolence. <laughs> Notice that this ladder leaves no room for the most common of human realities which is that intelligent people of goodwill sometimes disagree. And that, in fact, the only solution, uncomfortable as it may be, is to sit down and listen to each other. So it's especially important now, at this moment in history, because many of today's hot topics, affordable housing, citing wind turbines, school closures, they're so complex that they are what analysts call wicked problems. Wicked problem. Science can't give us one right answer, partly because of those competing identities and those underlying values. And it sounds so hard, but here's the thing. The world is full of, of what they call polarities, two crucial interdependent but contradictory variables that have to coexist. It's not easy, but we manage them every day. Parents have to be firm and flexible. A good boss is both grounded and visionary. Organizations have to embrace continuity and change. Here in Vermont, since 1788, right? We somehow functioned under the paradoxical motto, freedom and unity, 
contradictory, right? If I, I can't be completely free if I'm going to be unified with everyone. I can't be unified with you if we also want complete freedom. And yet we manage. We manage because we, we navigate. We navigate each decision. Issues become wicked when we're managing multiple polarities at once. So you've got a town planner who has to consider one group's interest in, say, open space and wildlife, but another's interest in economic vitality and another's in affordable housing. There's no single solution that's going to please everyone. The trick is that rather than thinking about solving wicked problems, we need to think about managing them, naming the competing values, exploring the trade-offs, doing that hard work that we do at town meeting of finding the best balance in each case. There's a great a professor in, in Colorado, Colorado State University, Professor Martin, Car, uh, Martin Carcassonne, and he explains that most of the time when we problem, problem solve, we use one of two models, either expertise, bring in the experts, right? They'll tell us what to do, or advocacy, right? Organize a campaign, one side's gonna win, that'll solve everything. Wicked problems are inherently different. They don't respond to technical solutions. They don't respond to advocacy. What they do respond to is slow, trusting, face-to-face -face communication. And as Carcassonne has noted, the solutions begin when we recognize that with wicked problems, it's the problem that's wicked and not the people. By focusing on our communities of place with slow democracy in our town meetings, we are focusing on what we share. Our community is literally our commons. And this focus helps us find that common ground. So I have a few quick tips on what we can do to get the best out of our town meetings. Um, but first, I'll just quickly point out three surprise dividends that re uh, researchers have found about deliberative engagement. Um, and the first one um, is civic health and citizen responsibility. So there's some great research on this. We find that when communities deliberate, or for example, juries, when people have um, participated in, in, a, in a jury, um, that measurably increases their voting rates for, for the rest of their lives. When we have made a binding decision, we have become part of government, it changes us. Deliberation also is proven to help us become more informed about public issues and solutions. We, we are more likely to want to pursue more information after we've deliberated. We're more likely to trust public institutions. We're more likely to volunteer. Um, Deliberation can strengthen that sense of community that we've talked about, that, that sense of respect and helping us look beyond stereotypes. And it actually can open us, open our minds uh, to new information, which means that new solutions can emerge. So it changes us individually. Um, there's a lot of research that's shown a link between citizen involvement and the local economy. For instance, um, there was a study that showed a correlation between engagement and community resilience against unemployment. So the, um, the, that's a plus as well. Um, and then this one, of course, makes sense. Um, civically engaged communities are more resilient in times of emergency. And, you know, Tropical Storm Irene or Sandy, we realized very quickly that Vermont was full of citizen leaders people who are accustomed to taking responsibility, not waiting for government to come and rescue them. We rescued each other. And this is one of the most low cost ways to protect ourselves against problems by ha taking on those leadership roles, whether, whether the problems are meteorological or social or even political, strengthening community engagement helps us solve them. So our town meeting is kind of like our historic buildings. It can always be updated, it can always be improved, New insulation, new solar panels, but it's not a teardown. The bones are strong. So I'll move really quickly through some, some tips on town meeting, and I'm especially going to move quickly because um, the Woodbury Town Meeting Committee um, has been doing a lot of this work. So this is, I really want to applaud and reinforce um, what, what folks are working folks are already doing here. Um, but um, if there are any ideas here, we can come back to any of them if you want more information. If you see any that inspire you, you can get involved too. And a lot of these um, are good throughout the year. So town meeting is so one day a year, but there's 364 other days we can, we can beef up democracy as well. So um, first one, child care. We have statistics very clearly showing that this can increase participation, uh, measurably especially among women. Boom, child care, do it. Um, highlight the issues. You know, there's always something interesting on a town meeting warning, 
But we frequently, maybe accidentally, hide it, <laughs> oftentimes in the budget. Um, so uh, maybe um, select boards you know, would just like not necessarily to attract attention to things, or sometimes it's just a matter of efficiency. But you know, if you've increased the amount you're paying the sheriff to address speeding, or if you've decreased the road salt, um, that's the kind of stuff people are interested in. And you can publicize it. You know, here's what's interesting about the budget this year. You can use front porch form. If you're really brave, and I've seen select boards do this, you can separate those articles out as a separate article. They take, and disembed them from the, war, from the uh, budget and just say, hey, look at this one. What do you think? Timing is important. Um, Vermont town meetings by law can happen, the, they, they happen the first Tuesday in March or any of the three days preceding. So um, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. This is a town by town decision. It very much depends on the demographics of your community. How many commuter, commuters do you have? How far do they travel? Um, definitely factor in school break. Um, uh, uh, if you switch to a Saturday and that Saturday is embedded within school break, that, that can be problematic. I, I know they found that in Jericho. So something to think about. Um, Sometimes think uh, that, uh, that they, 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 they think maybe Saturday could work. Others think that maybe a weeknight can work. Um, uh, they discover <laughs> that people really guard their free time. So maybe not a Saturday, maybe an evening. You could start your time meeting at 4 or 4.30 um, and then finish up in time for a community supper. Um, so there are a lot of different options and you can experiment with this um, over time. Um, and see which ones. Um, I would really urge you to literally count uh, the number of people who come and see if you can um, find some, some uh, uh, a solution that actually improves things. Um, this is a picture of the Bethel's operator's manual. I've got a couple of Middlesex operator's manuals as here. Um, and uh, these are, you know, hey, your, your town, your, uh, your car comes with an operator's manual, your blender comes with one. Why not your town, right? Um, and it can be printed, it can also be something that's on a website. Um, and I was excited to hear that the Woodbury Town Meeting Committee is considering creating an operator's manual. What does the Planning Commission do? What's the difference between planning and zoning? What's the deal with uh, dog licenses? You know, it's put, put it all in there. Um, and what it, what it means to live in this town sometimes doesn't always have to do with the, the municipal, uh, things the municipal that does. So it could be recreation and things as well. Um, a top recommendation is to create a committee that focuses on democratic, democratic engagement. And Woodbury has created one, so congratulations. Um, this, is, this is great. These are committees, they're not intended to advocate for, you know, vote yes on the town plan. The idea is to support good process. Um, and the Vermont Institute for Government has um, a bunch of resources that can be useful to committees like that. Uh, let's see here. We definitely want to welcome newcomers. Um, let's see here. Just give us a little bit order. I think I'm going to skip forward and come back to this one. I'm going to go to technology. In the age of Zoom, a lot of people are asking, can we offer remote town meeting participation? And the simple answer is yes, as long as you offer an in-person meeting, you can have a camera at your town meeting. People can watch from home. Um, it could be as simple as Zoom, uh, more formal, uh, like uh, uh, involving the local cable TV station. Um, the thing is that people cannot vote um, uh, if, they're, if they're from home. And that's because, as we discussed earlier, town meeting is not just a public hearing, it is a legislature making binding decisions. Um, and so voter identification is crucial. Um, and the state has not yet determined um, a system that they're confident in. Um, I suspect that this is something that will uh, change, the technology exists, so it's just a matter of, uh, of the law catching up. Um, let's see, I wanted to do, oh yeah, the history, this is a beautiful one. <clears throat> uh, this is an antique ballot box from Peachum. Um, so pretty. People, in order for democracy to thrive, folks need multiple points of entry. So before anyone is gonna go to a community meeting, they need to love the community. Um, I love that Woodbury has a pie breakfast, other annual traditions. These things are crucial in welcoming people. So it's really important. Um, the Conservation Commission might organize trail building where families can bring their kids and maybe some shovels. The Historical Society hosts a festival where they hear the stories, tour historic buildings, artifacts. Um, all, of the, all of those kinds of things make people um, confident that they live in a place. 
<coughs> I mentioned uh, eating. Is that, I'm gonna have a nice picture, yes. Eating, yes, I'm for it. Okay. Town meeting's a great time to honor volunteers, enjoy, celebrate, uh, give awards, food, the meal afterwards, coffee breaks, whatever it takes. Breaking bread together helps uh, people see each other as individuals. <coughs> and, um, and I do want to, we, we, we want to actively welcome everyone, young and old, newcomers, old timers, all abilities. There are lots of ways to do this. So East Montpelier um, instituted a welcome new voter letter. Every year they request the list of new additions to the checklist from the town clerk and they send out a letter explaining how town meeting works. Um, it's really crucial to uh, recognize and welcome immigrants and refugees, new Americans. Consider whether you may have translation needs in your materials or at the meeting. Um, keep in mind Vermont's population is aging. Consider whether physical accessibility to the meeting space and the sound system <laughs> we were just talking about, uh, whether it meets uh, everyone's needs. Um, and uh, of course, I did mention this graphic guy. I'm excited about this. This is a, um, uh, it, it's, the idea here is to welcome all Vermonters into participatory democracy. Um, so even, even Vermonters who prefer to look at comics. Um, <laughs> and so it's great for middle school and up. Um, this is what happens when you live in a state that is home for the Center for Cartoon Studies. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, it's a collaboration with the Vermont Humanities Council and Vermont Secretary of State's office. So I had so much fun working with this team. And a lot of adults have told me that they learned something from this. There was something in here that they didn't know. So bring it to your, your book group. And speaking of youth involvement in our town, uh, uh, in our town we recruit young people. Gotta move around again. <laughs> We actually have sixth graders who are runners, who run the microphones, and they, they will trot around the room um, carrying those microphones. Um, uh, awesome, yeah. Um, and you know, we just thank them with a, an ice cream cone gift certificate. But you know, honestly, I think they do it for the glory. And um, and it's 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 just it's kind of like the Senate pages. Uh, they they I, I think that they actually um, make keep everyone a little a little bit more civil, you know, um, because we, we know that we, are, we actually are the grown-ups in the room. Um, we have had students start the meeting by singing a, the state song, um, and we always have a new voter read aloud um, a civil invocation at the beginning of town meeting. And we have one! We have one here! Maverick Murphy is here. A brand new, gonna, gonna be voter, you're 17, is that right? Yeah, so about to be voter. Who is going to share, are you willing to come up? share the, a civil invocation with us um, that, could, uh, that could lead out a, a town meeting. So. Okay. Welcome to town meeting. We have come together in civil assembly as a community in a tradition that is older than our state itself. We come together to make decisions about our community. As we deliberate, let us advocate for our positions, but not at the expense of others. Let us remember that there is an immense gap between saying, I am right, and saying, I believe I am right. And that our neighbors with whom we disagree are good people with hopes and dreams as true and as high as ours. And let us always remember that, in the end, caring for each other in this community is of far greater importance than any difference we may have. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That is a beautiful way to begin a meeting, and it's a beautiful way to end this uh, presentation. Um, I think Vermonters know that we're in this together. Uh, we're in it for the long haul. Um, so thank you for your work in keeping your community strong um, far into the future. Mm. Questions? So discussion? Good. Yeah, yeah, I 
Personally and professionally, I'm a huge fan of Front Porch Forum. And um, one of the big differences between Front Porch Forum and other social media, um, if you think about Facebook or you know, some of these other tools, they are designed, the, the Facebook model is designed to keep you on Facebook. So it's designed to um, you know, click and then click again and keep going and oh, I found out this and oh, here's a link and you know, the, the next YouTube video, et cetera, et cetera. Front Porch Forum is specifically designed to get you out from your computer. You read from Porch Forum and you're like, oh, I need to go borrow that canoe. Or, oh my gosh, I need to go help bring that heifer that escaped. Or, um, you know, all of the different things to get you out into the community. And it's also moderated. Um, you know, real live Vermonters, whose job it is to read all of those posts that go on, make sure that they are, um, you know, as a moderator, I can tell you, you know, it's like, it's hard work. Um, it, <clears throat> make sure everybody, uh, um, stays civil, doesn't um, do any personal attacks. Um, they, they do occasionally have to, you know, return uh, posts and tell folks, um, here's our rules, and please write back again when you're ready to follow the rules. Um, which is, uh, uh, it, it, it creates, it's a very, it's a very different tool in that way. Um, so the Front Porch Forum has done research that, that definitely says that people who use Front Porch Forum say that they are better informed than they were before. Um, so I, I'm a I'm a huge fan um, with those with those qualifications. Yeah, Steve. Susan, I think you explained to me that there's there's been a study conducted where um, on the, the brain workings of the brain and mind that when people come together, maybe in a specific setting or in a group, their mind seeks common ground. Is that? Does that sound familiar? Hmm. I mean, I, I think that <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, there's. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned some of some of the brain science that it, that goes into um, the the deliberative process and sort of what happens when we are just plain old um, uh, given information, and then what happens when we actually chew on it together, and that there's that there's a difference. Um, you know, human beings. There's some very annoying habits of the human mind. Um, and the processes that we construct um, can exacerbate our least good qualities or they can bring out the better angels of our, of our nature. And it, the, the structures themselves um, can have a huge impact on that. And we, you know, we can sort of be cavalier about it and just say, oh, well, people, you know, people are just, people are just crappy, you know, or some people are like that. But in, in fact, the structure matters a lot. Um, and structures that allow everybody to talk, so um, uh, small group processes, um, which I would love to see us use. I mean, there's a lot of innovations we could do at town meeting. Um, and I would love to see us you know, break into small groups for some of the naughtier issues and then come back again. We have to suspend the rules, but I know we could do it. Um, and, uh, but at, in any case, uh, when we're at a human scale, like a small town level, um, a lot of those conversations are happening um, throughout the year. They're happening at the post office, they're happening at the store and the sidelines at the soccer game. And the town meeting itself is the decision making point. Um, but it was never intended to be the only meeting that happens um, during the course of the year. Um, and so I, I think that is, that is why town meeting um, works, works better in small towns than in larger ones. Large towns, by the way, we have some examples and all those in favor. Um, Burlington um, uh, has wards and the wards have neighborhood planning assemblies. Um, and so there are ways that you can take a large political body, break it down into town-sized um, groups and you take some of the lessons from town meeting and apply them. Yeah, Matter. Is there data that shows how voting with ballots differs from voting in town meeting? Like, is there data that shows if maybe people change political orientation or like, is it that significant that people will change their minds about issues or is it more about debating and being together? That's a really great question. I think that the, the main research that I'm aware of is the, is the research about what happens to us when we sit together and chew on, chew on issues together. So the actual fact of whether I raised my hand to vote or put a piece of paper in, I think is less crucial than what led up to it. Um, and in fact, Massachusetts, 
Where Australian ballot doesn't exist, I just want to say, for town meetings, um, the town me they have a town meeting system, um, and if your town um, is ready to move away from town meeting, you can move to a representative town meeting, like we have in Brattleboro, and there are dozens of those in Massachusetts, across New England, actually, where people are elected to attend town meeting and have that deliberation, or you can change to a city. Um, but um, there, there is no Australian ballot. But they do have a system in Massachusetts where um, people, when you come into the meeting, um, some towns have these little, um, they're handheld devices, um, and when it's time to vote, you, um, you mm -hmm. use the handheld device mm -hmm. so, that they're, so that you're not saying aye or nay, you're just pressing the, um, the button and the results show up, mm -hmm. um, which is a way to, it's kind of a, it's an electronic way to use the paper ballot, which we have in Vermont. Any, mm -hmm. any town meeting, if seven people want to use a paper ballot, you, you can have that, um, but this is a quicker way. So that's a, um, and, and I don't know if there have been studies on whether it affects um, people, um, uh, you still get the deliberation, I think, is the, is the important piece of that. So. Something we could definitely look at in Vermont. Yeah. Just, uh, from, you know, to report back to my daughter about how I felt at town meeting in terms of like, do I go in with certain things I'm gonna vote on and I do, I'm not gonna change my mind no matter what anyone says, that's not the case for me. Um, even if it didn't change my vote that day, I continued to think about what the people said, and it, it informs a lot of conversations that we have at the house, and mm -hmm. so I do feel like it does make a difference in terms of people's evolution of thinking. That's something that, oh, I did a lot of interviews when I was in Switzerland looking at the way, because all Swiss towns, they're called communes, um, and all, every Swiss town is run by a town meeting. Even Zurich, 350,000 people, has a representative town meeting, a town parliament. Um, and one of the things that people said again and again in Switzerland was that um, the voice of the minority was really important in informing um, decisions, even if, you know, technically these guys won and these guys lost. It was, it, there was always going to be a revisitation of policies throughout time and um, knowing uh, the, it, that it wasn't just casting a ballot, you actually heard the voices and understood the arguments of people who were in the minority um, helped inform policies going forward. Yeah. So this is, this is not to be a, 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 a hard, or it's a confusing question, but um, I watched the town meeting here in Woodbury last year, um, and, um, and watched some of the discussion about whether we should have it or not, and the reasons why opting to not want to have the time meeting and those that did. And I guess among this group, probably, and I don't know for sure, but it's likely that we can be a supportive of the town meeting. I don't know that to be the case, but, but how do you, what argument do you make, or not argument in an in a argumentative way, but what's your compelling reasons for people who don't want to have a town meeting? Um, what do you find convinces that group of people that and, and what I heard in some of the objections were things like, ah, you know, all we do is vote to buy more things or spend more money and we can't afford it. And the people who want to go to town meeting can, and we feel awkward about saying no. I, I don't know if that depicts exactly what mm -hmm. was said, but there seems to be a, a thread of that involved. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is there's a sense, or there was a sense in that um, floor um, discussion that folks who didn't want town meeting felt that if they switched to the ballot, that they might be able to defeat some articles? I don't, I, I don't mean to project it just on Woodbury, but in general. Uh, oh, no, I've definitely heard that argument before, yeah. so I'm not, yeah. not saying anything yeah. about Woodbury. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and was there a moment in Woodbury during COVID when you, when you used Australian ballot temporarily? Just during COVID. During COVID, yeah. So two one or two years, yeah. And how did that go? Did everything pass? Did some things not pass? Mm -hmm. Everything passed. I think the total was maybe 20 or 30 percent more than our average town meeting numbers. So you mean more people voted? Yeah. Not but, a huge right. Yeah. So more people voted, which is not at all uncommon. It's so much easier to cast a ballot than it is to sit in these folding chairs for hours, right? So more people voted, and but but what was the um, the outcomes? You're saying didn't change. The, in, in our town, we had the same experience, um, that uh, we got more people voting, but the outcomes didn't change. So 
that's one piece. What, one, it's like we accidentally experimented for two years with that argument of if only I could cast a ballot, things would be different in this town. Um, and we accidentally found out, at least in, well, here's, this is a two-town sample. <laughs> um, I haven't heard of a lot of um, dramatic shifts in outcomes because, uh, in outcomes. Um, because of because of uh, switching to Australian ballot, so I think that's that's an important piece. Um, but the fairness piece really resonates for me. There are people who say it's just look, we get more people when we vote with a ballot than we do when we have a meeting, a and more democracy is better. And and I I get that. Um, and I think that what's valuable, and this is actually a workshop that I'm that I'm working on developing right now, is um, having a discussion where we actually, um, rather than pitting meeting versus ballot, let's talk about the merits of democratic quantity and the merits of democratic quality. Because I think this is a case of the good guys versus the good, good guys. Mm -hmm. I think this is a case where we actually agree that we would really like more people involved and we also value hearing the minority, we value seeing each other as people, we value being able to change our own minds. Um, and when we have that conversation, likewise, we need to have the other, the, the other two poles, which are, there's such a thing as the overuse of democratic quantity, and there's such a thing as the overuse of relying on equality. And once we can actually parse out um, that, uh, th those four poles, um, we can start to talk about how can we get the benefits of this the, the of quantity that we want and, and quality. And basically what we're trying to create together is a third way. Um, and that answer is gonna be different for every town. It's gonna be different for your demographics and it's gonna be different for a, a, any number of, of things. And for some towns, it might mean switching to Australian ballot. But if it does, we need to know what we are giving up in terms of that quality and how are we gonna make up for it? How are we gonna make up for it? If we're going to switch to ballot, well then how are we going to get together in ways that are meaningful and empowered where we can hear each other's viewpoints, not just social things, which we all know human beings mostly only come to social things when we know people, so it's less likely to be that diverse population. Um, so, and, and, and there are answers to that, but we need to craft them. It's sort of a, it's almost like a Jeffersonian moment if you, if you, if you can handle a reference to the founders. Um, how can we create a better, a better town meeting, a, a better democracy? Or if we're going to stick with town meeting, as Woodbury has so far decided, then how can we make sure that people feel welcome? How can we make sure that they have um, the information throughout the year, things like the operator's manual? What are some ways that we can enrich our democracy throughout the year so that we can um, hopefully even increase the number of folks who come to that meeting? in Berlin for years, and I only had made, uh, missed one town meeting, and that was the day my son was born, um, until they changed to Australian ballot. It changed the town completely, and um, my sense of community totally changed, um, and I found that I was a less informed voter because, boy, you could have those old people with their little charts going after every single thing. <laughs> and you said, oh, will they ever end? But you learned a lot. And so I think it's, there's a huge change if you lose that and once it's gone, your community can change dramatically. And that scares me. Thank you for sharing that. I, that I, I, that's a really important perspective, you, that you've actually lived through that. And, and I've heard folks um, tell that story. Um, that it, and in a sense, we kind of know what a town looks like that doesn't have a town meeting because it looks like a lot of the rest of America. Um, and um, you know, we saw that, that argument, that, <laughs> that visual of people sort of yelling at each other. Um, human beings need um, ways to to, to connect in place um, and 
you know, town meeting is definitely not the only way. That's why we wrote the book Slow Democracy. Um, but it is, it's a remarkable way. And we need to, we need to know what we have. Other thoughts or questions or? I'd, I'd just like to just state something you told me when we were talking about having this meeting. You said that uh, democracy is not something we have, but something we do. It's like gardening. <laughs> Every year, it never ends. Thankfully, it never ends. So I just want to thank you for that thought that's been with me. <laughs> now, yeah, Francis Morlapay, I think, said, Fran it, it said uh, democracy is not something we have, it's something we do, and it has really stuck with me. And I do, sometimes it feels, we were kind of joking, it's like, oh my gosh, it's relentless, right? It's like, do we have to make another decision? Didn't we already make that? Didn't we already adopt that plan five years ago, and I have to adopt it again, and it's got these changes, da, 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 da. and it's like gardening, right? Where we sh if we could just see it as, Oh, we have tilled the soil, and we are ready for new growth. <laughs> you know, um, then, then we can um, feel uh, hopefully more positive about it. It was absolutely intended to be a cycle that we are constantly. Uh, it, it's never done, and and that's a good thing. Yes. Not only you don't have it unless you practice it, uh, because it's a skill, just like gardening. You have to practice it, and that's where classes like civics in high school and things that they do in the elementary school are really important because it gives children and it gives young people the ability to practice that democracy. Otherwise, you know, like my husband is often saying, democracy means so many things to different people. So you have to even have those discussions of what does democracy mean. Mm -hmm. uh, to you in a specific time in your life, and how do you voice? How do you um, practice? Yeah, yeah. I w when I interviewed people for all those in favor, um, uh, Professor Brian gave me high participation towns, and I went and interviewed folks in those towns, um, and sort of looking for what were some trends. And one of the things that I kept hearing was people who had gone to town meetings when they were kids. Um, and they, they said, well, I didn't understand what was going on, but I thought it was, you know, people were, you know, grown-ups were sassing each other, and, you know, there was food, and, uh, and this is, in, in their minds, this is what democracy looks like. It looks like people figuring stuff out together. Um, and I think that kind of modeling is, is super important, which is one of the reasons I got so excited about working on the comic book. Um, because it is about, it's, it could have been, and there are comic books about, you know, the three branches of government, blah, 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 but this is, it's all about participation. It's about all the different ways you can dig in, so, yeah. I just, I'm running for town for Devon and I work at the elementary school right now, I'm a fair educator, and so a postcard went out last weekend with my picture on it to every voter. Um, somebody is doing that for me, it makes me very uncomfortable. But all my kids came in today and were like, Miss Teagan, we saw your picture in our mailbox. <laughs> and I had adults come to me and say, yeah, they asked me about what you were doing, and then we had to tell them what a town clerk was and what an election was. And then we went to, and I was like, even if I don't win, even if like nothing goes right from this point on, all these elementary kids went home and asked their parents, and what is a town clerk? What's going on? And so like, that was really exciting. Yeah, wow, fantastic, yes. Craftsbury, I know, did a, um, they used the comic book, I think, with the fifth graders, and then they invited the town clerk and the town rep, um, uh, 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 Catherine Sims, um, to come in and talk with them. And um, I think it was the town clerk, what? Oh, it was a select board member who, um, and she was like, yeah, I got to sit, and they asked me questions. Do you like cats? Um, <laughs> Um, but knowing that you can reach out and touch your democracy is a really, really different feeling, I think. that. But I mean, when you talk with people who come from elsewhere, even secretaries of state who visit Vermont and visit and, and tour Vermont with the Vermont Secretary of State, Jim Douglas used to talk about this, they, the other secretaries of state were just like, oh, my brain is exploding, I don't understand, there's so much democracy here. <laughs> like you, I can't believe you give people all this power. And Jim was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> this has been very inspiring for me and encouraging. Uh, and what the young lady said here, uh, 
reminded me of when my wife and I arrived in Vermont, you know, the welcoming um, for a uh, Puerto Rican from the Bronx, you know. Uh, it was the town meeting, and it was the, you know, the, what we refer to then as the uh, native Vermonters who took you under, your wing, under their wing. And one of the first ones that I met uh, carried a little uh, copy of the U.S. Constitution and would always say, this is against the U.S. Constitution or some policy that mm -hmm. was being discussed in the newspapers. Uh, but, but I wonder what's your opinion um, if you think that democracy in general, not just in town meetings, is under attack you know, within the United States. And I want to reference, and I can't remember the document, but it appeared in the U.S. Uh, strategic defense plan back in the 70s, I think. And what the military was saying to the elected officials was that the question of the 21st century is not going to be if there was too little democracy, but that if there was too much democracy, that you know, the people would become disenchanted, uh, unattached from their political leaders and their parties, and that they would demand more democracy in the sense of more inclusion uh, in decision making, more sharing of the natural resources. And I'm wondering if that frontal attack, and I think it does exist, it's a concerted effort on elements within the uh, body politic, uh, can um, things like town meetings prosper? And they are, the, I think, the building block. That's where we learn. I think that they're the building block as well. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons that I put my energy as a whatever I call myself, social change practitioner, um, at the local level. Um, because this is where I see, I see islands of sanity. And if we can connect those islands of sanity, maybe we can create a continent. Um, my idea is that, and I mean, this is, this is what this, this, this data is showing, um, is that human beings know how to do this right. We certainly can be inspired to do it wrong. We totally can be inspired um, in, uh, to, uh, and, and led to, toward um, more their authoritarian and less democratic um, processes. Um, but we are innately uh, social animals and we are innately empathic. Um, and so the better systems that we can create to um, uh, engender those um, better uh, qualities, um, the, I mean, frankly, the more hope there is. Um, yeah, this is a really scary time for democracy. It's a really scary time for democracy. Um, uh, and it's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about local democracy. Yes? Uh, I, I just have an observation, having been in the Woodbury town for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that what I remember about those early years, early 70s, when I first was a newcomer to town, was that the dissent was often against the newcomers in town. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel that way anymore. I, or I, I, I think I've seen it lessen. I've also really enjoyed, yeah, getting to know people from year to year. Because you may not see those people but in a way, you're, build, you're building on their, uh, their information, their experience, their positions. And it, it doesn't always change my point of view, but it certainly broadens it and it mm -hmm. makes me respect them in a different way, especially since we seem to be having a pretty civil conversation <laughs> most of the time. But yeah, it, it, it is an evolution of a town. If you, uh, that's very rich. I mean, I guess bottom line is I, I think that we should keep it going because it is so important. Um, well, if you could bring a neighbor um, who hasn't been, um, I mean, I, I, I think that there is a generational um, uh, passing of knowledge and passing of tradition and of um, really culture. And, and Vermont has a town meeting culture. Even people in Burlington who have never been to a town meeting live in a state 
where the expectations are that on the first Tuesday in March there will be decisions made at the local level and there will be and so there's a there's a sense just like Colorado has a cowboy culture right um, uh, New England has a, a town meeting culture and um, the better we can um, model that um, and bring new people into it um, the, the, uh, the stronger it will be these cookies are just like called me. <laughs> how, how are you guys doing? <laughs> yes. Another important thing to know is that last two town meetings when we had Australian ballots, the state paid for those ballots to be mailed to everyone on the checklist. And so, you know, there were like 400 out of the 700 people who had their ballots and their prepaid envelopes and everything else, they didn't bother to return them. We had less than half. We mailed our ballots as well, and, let, and, and, it, and we had some hot stuff on our warning too, um, which tends to increase participation. Um, and um, so it's hard to know. Is it like, is that because everybody's just super happy, and they're like, I don't need to vote. Everything's going great. Or is it because they think they don't matter, or is it just got lost, or it's, it's hard. It's hard to know. But it's, it's really not uncommon. Um, so ballots. If we pick that as a solution, we need to know it's not a solution to everything. So. All right. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.